Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Creative Live After Hours. My name is Mark Bumgarten. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Seattle Weekly. And today I'm going to be talking to Eric Anderson and Matt Beatty of Cataldo. Um, these guys are in studio. They're going to play a few songs for us. And uh, let's start out right now. They're going to play In Now and Then. Take it away, guys. Got through that. Yeah. Uh, Hello, Mark. Hey, Eric. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I think we have to address the elephant in the room. What do you mean? Uh, the fact that we both wore the exact same outfit today. I see that now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was not planned, <laughs> but we are mind melding. Yeah, it's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was great. So um, that's off of your latest album, Gilded <clears throat> Oldies, Yeah. Mm -hmm. which came out a year and a half. Ago? Yeah, March 2014. So oh, okay, a year ago. Yeah, a year ago. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have three albums to your name. Four. One that I don't want to talk about. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, a total of four now. All right, yeah. cool. And um, so uh, you just came off playing a Sasquatch Music Festival in the Gorge yeah. this last weekend. So um, are you, you know, a year out from, from a, a new album, are you 
still relying on a lot of that material, or are you beginning to play new stuff? What's the uh, what's the mix right now? Um, I think we kind of trans we had a year of playing with a pretty big band. Um, we had a three piece horn section, and then I was mostly just singing, uh, which was a really good experience and something I learned a lot from. Uh, but for a variety of creative and financial reasons, I wanted to try <laughs> getting it back to a smaller band. And so right now we're a five piece guitar, bass, drums, um, keys, and a Barry sax. And so for that reason, we kind of just cherry picked songs from other records that work with that uh, setup. And so the Barry sax can kind of cover enough of the stuff from Gilded Oldies that has a lot of uh, horns on it. And then that instrument can be, it's really interesting because it can be either something that really cuts and carries like a melodic part, but it can also just support, uh, like just play a root note and just fill out sound. And so it's a really uh, flexible instrument for that reason. So yeah, we've been playing kind of a little bit from the, the past three albums. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Matt, how, how long have you been playing with, with Eric? Mm, six years, mm -hmm. I think. All right. Yeah. Okay. And you, but you, but Cataldo's been around for a, almost uh, a decade now. May twentieth, uh, two thousand five was our first record release. Okay. So yeah, ten years. It's All crazy. right. So Matt, what uh, what's the biggest difference for you between playing with a, a more sort of you know orchestral kind of like ten ten people on stage <clears throat> and and playing with the the more stripped down element? Which one do you like better? I mean, it doesn't make a huge difference for me. Because you're playing it, a different instrument, though. You're playing bass instead of guitar. You're playing bass, which is cool because you can kind of turn your brain off and just <laughs> hang out. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> bass player. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm just more relaxed now. I can focus more on singing when I'm playing bass, which is cool. Um, but honestly, it's so hard in a rock band setting to get horns loud enough in your monitor mix to hear them that I feel like I only ever really hear them in rehearsal and then mm -hmm. they're just in my head at the shows. Hmm. So I pretty much hear the same stuff whether or not they're there. That's funny because you're in like a similar position on stage in both iterations and they're right next to me but they're across the stage from you so I don't have the experience at all. It's really funny because they're just like I could touch all of them. They're that close. you know. By the time we get around to checking the horns the sound guy is so over it <laughs> that I don't even I don't want to put him through getting the, a good mix for me. Oh yeah, sure. So I just imagine that they're playing really good. I think they do too. <laughs> yeah, they do mostly. I've heard. So you so you Gilded Oldies was uh you know was a big project. It was a step forward for the band mm -hmm. where where you were embracing a more sort of um, beat bass sound. I think playing a lot more with um, with some like more hip hop beats. I think and mm -hmm. uh, drum machine. And uh, and also in the live setting, bringing out this you know this this big band, um, dropping your guitar, doing a little, becoming more of a, a lead man uh -huh. um, uh, out there, naked to the world, literally and naked, literally naked. Uh, <laughs> you can't play a lot of places. Uh, but oh, now wow. you're working on um, uh, a new album. What did you learn from that whole experience? And what was it like? Mm -hmm. You know. You went from the concept and putting the album together to actually having to play it live. What did you learn about songwriting through through that experience, and how are you approaching it differently now? That's a good question. I think one of one of the biggest things I learned, and this really came more in like mixing the record, is like uh, you get to a point where you're like, oh man, I really want the drums to knock. I just want like you know really great sounding drums. And as you're recording, particularly if you're not like the world's best recording engineer or arranger or whatever, you say to yourself, like, okay, so I should, I should have, like, 10 kick drums and, like, a bunch of different snare sounds and all these things. And what I realized in mixing is that uh, you can either have, like, 10 kick drums turned up to one or one kick drum turned up to 10, that no matter what, you hit this threshold that you can't make something louder. And so if you're in a room playing... Uh, 10 kick drums at the same time, you'd be like, wow, what a huge sound. But in a record, sometimes one thing played really well and turned up loud can sound better and like knock harder than a whole bunch of things at once. So like in Now and Then is a great example. That song has like two drummers and all this percussion and it's this big showy thing. 
But live, I feel like it kind of knocks harder almost just having one guy play it really well, you know? Yeah. And so I'm trying to keep that in mind when I'm composing and arranging this next record, uh, which we're pretty far down the line on, line on. just like, eh, don't let insecurity make you keep putting more and more stuff on. Like, just leave it as it is and turn everything up louder because ultimately what you're really doing is just kind of creating a cover for stuff that you've, you're not quite sure if it's good or not. Just like commit to performances, commit to arrangements, and don't, you know, have the the recorded version of an eight piece band or like the analogous thing, you know, just like so much stuff on there. Uh, it's, it's not stripped down at all. It's just not quite as bananas, uh, in the arrangement. All right. All right. So you guys are going to play another song mm -hmm. for us. This is the title track from the album, yeah, right? Kill the Doldies. Uh, tell us just like, tell us the most interesting thing about this song to you. Mm. Well, when we were sound checking it earlier, uh, it sounded kind of like Billy Ocean. That was pretty cool. Uh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> it was just sort of like, you know, it was sort of like a, almost like a, like a white people Caribbean vibe uh, for me. Oh, so like Sugar Ray. <laughs> Not quite. I mean, you be the judge, internet. All right. Uh, okay, thanks, Take it Mark. away. says don't make a sound so you lay quiet until the darkness falls and you get the feeling there is no one around you slip your hand inside your shirt to feel a heart that's wondering what awaits you and who wait up to meet you now Polished off the drinking story. What awaits you? And who wait up to meet you now? But you are jacked up on the gilded oldies. I thought I'd let you know that I. Have a look with new ideas on how the ending works. And I'm a big boy, so I had to let him go. For all God's creatures have the bridge to burn. This is mine smoldering. What awaits you? And who wait up to meet you now? You are terrifying morning glory What awaits you And who wait up to meet you now But you are jacked up on the gilded onies Ask the room if you can hang tough But the room to play this off the cuff So I will sit on my hands A lack of actions One way to decide What awaits you A way to wait off that black night Yes, it's a long walk With your map still folded I squint my eyes, it's true To see things written in the sky Yes, you are jacked up On the gilded arm
Yeah, it was good. Thanks. <laughs> you see what I'm um, talking about the Billy Ocean thing? It's a little... A little bit, yeah. It's got kind a of a gallop thing. It was all Eric Anderson to me. Good. <laughs> I didn't get any sugar out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, I mean, you and I have talked about your, your music quite a bit um, in the last, like, eight years, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's true. Um, but I've never uh, asked you about... Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really remarkable about your music, and uh, especially on this latest album, is that it really feels like you're settling into your voice, and there's a real ease with it, and there's like, your 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 voice just comes really, like naturally and easy, mm -hmm. and um, like many great music, uh, great voices in pop music, your voice is not the archetype of what you would imagine is a great pop voice. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. But, um, I disagree, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I guess my question is, you know, did it, uh, did it take you a while to get to the point where you were comfortable with your voice? Mm -hmm. And uh, what different iterations did you go through while you were trying to figure it out? Well, when I started out, I was mostly playing in situations without like a good PA and very often I like kind of came up sort of splitting my time between Minneapolis and Olympia, Washington and Seattle. And in Olympia, it's like a very house show centric world. And so really grew up as a musician, like blasting it out, like as kind of as loud as I could. And on this record, the past one, it's the vocals are a lot more conversational, like just more mellow, and it's like kind of at my speaking voice volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, to me, that's a, usually a sign of singers I really like is that their speaking voice and their uh, singing voice are similar. It's not like if like if I talk like this in like my, my little nasal, you know emotional guy voice and then went up there and I was like well you know what like <laughs> like sometimes right. you see that and you're like no <laughs> I'm not sold uh, <laughs> by that uh, put upon this anyway uh, but it's funny what I realized with the big band is like I'm asking really for a tough thing which is to have a loud group of musicians on stage just by virtue of there being eight people it's loud and loud drums and then come up there and sing like I thought I'd let you know just so, you know, low. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny, like, I guess like a lot of people you see saw a little bit as a reaction to what you just did, but I'm sort of consciously trying to do a better job picking keys because all these songs are written really me just in my bedroom, you know, or office or whatever, depending on the year it was written. But um, with these songs, I'm more trying to think of... When did of, you switch from bedroom to office? Uh, well, when I lived on Capitol Hill, I had my piano in my bedroom. Right. And then so I went... Now you're all office. Well, I went through a transition period where my desk was in my living room of my new place in the Central District. And then I moved again when I moved in with my girlfriend. And so it's, now I can afford a two-bedroom. And I'm like, you know what should go in this second bedroom? all my music stuff <laughs> and she has graciously let me do that so anyway uh so yeah i'm sort of more writing picking keys thinking and performing and so not like obnoxiously blasting it out but just a little bit more thoughtful with that because even so like in now and then is just such a hard song to sing with the band mm. uh, because you have everything coming at the chorus really big and i'm literally going I'll be in now and then, just that low. Low, and it's hard to hear. Yeah, but so. that's, I mean, I think that that's part of what's great about it. On the record, it works this, great, but yeah, it's, the, after but a year live. and a half of playing it, it's just like, and of course, like, if you had, like, someone sending you an in-ear monitor mix with that's compressed perfectly, and I'm sure I'd be singing a different tune. Mm. Yeah, that's oh, right. Wow. Uh, but uh, right. but as it is now, it's like, ah, I, I plan on being in small rock clubs for quite a while, so... It's like, it's so funny, like, certain things just sound good in a rock club. Yeah. Guitar, bass, drums just works, hmm. you know? And I feel like the band is kind of inching towards that uh, over the course of the past 10 years just by virtue of, you know, the context that you're in, you kind of mold yourself to do a good job in. And I feel Didn't like... Didn't you say recently that our job when we play at bars, which is where we play, is to play music that you can grab people's butts to? Well, <laughs> I said a version of that. <laughs> which was... Uh, uh. Well, 
Up until oh, sorry. A, oh, apology not accepted. Uh, up until a very late stage of the game, you're an alcohol salesman, you know. And uh, that's just the financial breakdown of every rock club in America. And so it's really funny that people who are most fascinating to watch as performers are people who transcend that. So people who end up in a theater. And so like Sufjan Stevens is a great example. He can put on the show that he did two years ago at the Paramount where if there's like, you know, 30 people on stage and it's just such a huge production or I can do what I assume he'll do on this record, which is so much more intimate and do a small ensemble and just kind of do whatever you want because everyone just shows up ready for you. They're not there to drink. They're not there to dance. They're there to just watch you perform music. And the people on the exact other end of that spectrum, that house show world that I came out of, like you'll never find a more accepting group of people than the people like sitting, honestly, exactly like this, just like very close to you and like listening intently and ever in between in that bell curve, you're there to sell booze. And as a result, music to drink to, and what is the best activity to, to do while drinking? <laughs> Butt grabbing. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Consensual, be consensual, consensual butt beautiful butt grabbing, <laughs> not, not, not assault. Um, Sufjan, if you want to weigh in on this, tweet at us at Cataldo <laughs> Music on Twitter. But you, I mean, uh, but you want to move people. You want people to dance. Wasn't that kind of the mm -hmm. like one of the things that you were trying to get out of this, the, the last album? Yeah, I mean, really, it's in this record. This one I'm working on is very much the same way. It's just a reflection of what I'm listening to a lot of, and I would say like the compositional elements of the drums and the way I thought about the drum beats was more like a pop song or a hip hop song in that it's like, okay, there's like kick, snare, and then some type of keep timekeeping in between those mm -hmm. things. Uh, like, uh, I mean, pick your Nicki Minaj song that works like that. She's like the total extreme, like the lowest low thing you can possibly get. <laughs> And then, like these super, super high, and that's when she, her, like, you know, little mid rangey, <laughs> just like cut so good. Uh, Nikki, if you'd like to weigh in on this, tweet on this. Cataldo music on I Twitter. I just wish they were all going across the bottom. Uh, that's what we need back here, man, is like live tweets coming in from, the celeb from all the hottest names in music. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my face is good too, but. Yeah. Anyway. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about the the new album. So, uh -huh. have you written all of the all of the songs? Have you recorded demos? Where are you at on it? That's a good question. Uh, I met with my lawyer. Whatever. Like, that is something I did. Where I was like, I don't know if I'm writing demos. If I'm writing demos for like a fancy producer guy, or if I'm writing like another indie rock record, because my expectations for pop music are so high. Like, Carly Rae Jepsen song sounds so good, and I don't know how to do that. Like, I can make that in my bedroom, but which you, is maybe for the best. But you've never worked with a, a producer no. before, Well, right? I mean, Tucker Martin is a very excellent producer, has mixed the past three albums, and but it's not like a creative partnership, like you're writing songs together, and like the modern sort of producer mode, which is really a composer, I mean, you're co-composing with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and I asked him about it, I was like, what, like, how do I get, there's no money here that is, there's no indication that there will be money forthcoming. So like, how do I get someone's like best interest if I decide I wanna play around with that? And he had good advice, was just like, just finish stuff and then let the world tell you like, what it is. I was feeling very lost. But don't you have to make a commitment to, like, if you're recording something and you decide that, I mean, I feel like you'd have to decide whether it's a demo or not because you have to decide the amount of commitment that you have mm -hmm. to that certain recorded artifact. That's that, really true. And you know, you Matt know, disagrees. <laughs> uh, There's only one rule in recording music. Man. What's that? If it sounds good, it's good. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, well, what I ended up doing is, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Sam Anderson from Hey Marseille, uh, got in touch, and he had just come off working with a very fancy pants producer guy, who like was is very fo like during the discussion of the album was focused on like all right, like how many YouTube views does a song like that get, you know? 
And uh, this is for the the new Hey Marseille album. Right? Uh, I don't want to tip my hand about too much of anything, but anyway, <laughs> uh, tip anyone. I'm, I really tip someone else's hand, which is definitely something I don't want to do. But anyway, Sam was all keyed up with his energy and he had some time and he reached out to me to see if I wanted to work on something. And I came to him with stuff really in a nascent place that is not finished at all, which I had never really done before, and ended up collaborating with Sam. I wouldn't say like co-composing music together, but really being like, well, I don't know what the verse for this should be. Like, let's try a bunch of stuff. And as a result, was kind of less controlling, let my hand off the wheel a little bit, and got in a place where like I could be really creative uh, without freaking myself out too bad and being willing to just throw stuff away in kind of a more willy-nilly way than I have before. And I've ended up with something that I think sounds really good. Uh, like, I don't think it sounds like demos. And so, yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm very excited about where it's headed. So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Thanks. Me too. Um, so we're about out of time. We're going to have you guys play one more song mm -hmm. for us uh, from the last album, Other Side, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, so why don't you do it? Uh, Eric Anderson, Matt Beatty of Cataldo. Thank you guys so much for chatting with me thank for a you, little Mark. bit. Great. Thanks, so Mark. Much fun. Yep. Uh, thanks yeah. to Creative Live for having us, too. Yeah, thanks to Creative Live. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks. We're going to drop D so you know it's getting intense. Come back to our screamo roots. <laughs> going. There's so many great songs that are written in drop D. can't escape my mind My body quits, I get the blues And angry when the father sit Can't see it's left me behind But someday in a moment unacknowledged by the sprawl my heart will beat so hard that it can break The terracotta shell the beast has made Keeps me lonesome and acting smart So oh my, my I'll keep you on the other side Someday happens pretty soon And I can quiet every soft internal Sort of voce monologue It's pulling me away from you it Still would not be wise to let you in this is just a borrowed book that I had read but never understood And it makes staying uneven a sin So oh my, my I'll keep you on the other side
Thanks very much. <laughs>